please be upstanding for His Worship the Mayor. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, today's full council, Wednesday, the 13th of December. Uh, please note this meeting will be recorded for subsequent broadcast via the authorities' intranet site. The images and sound recording may also be used for training purposes within the authority. The public seating areas will be in view of the camera. And by entering the chamber and using the public seating area, members of the public are consenting to be filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings as outlined above. So the first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. We have apologies from Councillor Howard Barry. Councillor ha Howard Barry, Councillor Paul Brown and Councillor Tony Rogers. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda Declarations of interest, members are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and prejudicial interest in respect of matters contained in this agenda in accordance with the provisions of the Local Government and Finance Act 1992 related to council tax, the Local Government Act 2000, the con council's constitution and the members code of conduct. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to declare an interest in item five I'm a co-opted member of Bidinall Community Council. Uh, Mr. Mayor, item 12, uh, post 16 home to school transport, uh, recovery of deal in home to school transport contracts. So I'll wait for that. Mr. Mayor, I'm also a, a member of Bidinall Community Council of item five. Any more? So item three on the agenda is notice of motion, and that's on pages one to two. It's the end of the public, say, pu public sector pay pinch. Um, I understand the leader is taking this one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the council notes that in this motion, pay squeeze in the public sector have now been enforced for almost a decade, with the real terms impact on workers running into thousands of pounds of cuts. There is no democratic mandate for the scale of cuts. The policy has gone further than either coalition party promised in their manifestos for the 2010 general election. I was not presented as part of the Conservative 2015 manifesto. The squeeze on pay has had a disproportionate impact on women, with women making up two thirds of the public sector workforce. The likelihood of rising inflation following Brexit will worsen the public the problem, raising the total real terms cost of the average full-time public sector worker to 4,073 by 2020. The public supports an end to the pay squeeze. Independent polling carried out by Servation found that 75% of all voters <coughs> support above inflation increases in public sector pay, including 69% of Conservative voters. The squeeze on pay has put pressure on staff recruitment and retention. This is likely to be a contributing factor to the massive two billion in brackets 28% increase in spending on temporary and contract staff between 2011-12 and 2014-15. The government can afford to end the pay cap early. By reversing its cuts, its corporation tax rates, the government could meet the 8.5 billion needed in this parliament to end the pay squeeze across the whole public sector. This council believes that public services and the people who deliver them are important. Pay for public sector workers should not be set by arbitrary government caps, but by collective bargaining and pay review bodies that can better address the complexity of pay decisions. The government needs to take responsibility and fully fund increases in pay. It should not put the burden on public sector employees, such as local authorities, whose funding has been cut to the bone. This council supports GMB's campaign to end the public sector pay pinch and calls on the government to commit to an end to public sector pay cuts, proper funding for public services. 
restoration of independence to the pay review bodies, a real living wage of at least £10 an hour for all public sector workers. Mr Mayor, I move the motion. Do we, do we have a seconder? Yes, Mr Mayor, I'd like to second the motion in doing so, echo everything that the Leader has just pointed out in this notice of motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mitten. Are there any questions? Any comments? Councillor Barry Youth, Senior. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And, uh, Mr Mayor, I'd simply say I'm really pleased that the uh, Lead Group have brought this notice of motion forward and it's got the full support of the Labour Group. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I fully support this motion. And in doing so, um, I refer to the um, dot right up from the bottom dot where it refers to uh, the pressure on staff recruitment and retention and the fact that uh, the contributing factor is the, this tw 2 billion increase in spending on temporary and contract staff between 2011-12 and 2014-15. I have no doubt whatsoever that since that time that figure can be increased probably by at least another billion. Having been an ex-local government officer who spent 30 odd years in local government, I indeed know the pressures. I have never known an occasion as bad as this one in all the years I've been in public service. It seems to me that the government of the day, frankly, do not care about the public sector anywhere. And for people who may well have been in the past been interested in applying um, for a post in local government, I have no doubt they look at it, see the fact that there is at this moment in time no future and go elsewhere. It's a, a really uh, sad time, I feel, for public sector and local government in particular. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Are there any other comments? Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to um, congratulate the leader and his team for bringing this motion to uh, Council tonight. I entirely concur with, with what he has said and with what Councillor Mayton has said. Um, I think this government completely takes for granted uh, it, the public sector workers and it has made them second-class citizens in the workplace. Uh, this, this motion at least draws their attention to it and how, th how this council views the way they are treating its own workers. Uh, thank you, Councillor Amos. Are there any other co comments? No, and can we take that to the vote then, please? Thank you, that motion is carried. Yes, uh, perhaps I should have said this before we start, and I apologise for that, members. Um, what we've done is adjust the screens slightly. You will recall that at the last meeting we had a problem with the screens. That's been fixed now, so what will happen is, although you can't see what's happening as you are voting, you will see, once the vote is concluded, who voted and what they voted so that you get the clear picture of what um, the, the measure of voting was uh, and there's a picture which will tells you who's sitting in what, um, what seat so that you can see what's happened. I'm sorry, I should have announced that before. Thank you, Karis. Um, the next item on the agenda is agenda item number four. It's the minutes of the previous meetings to approve as accurate the minutes of the following meetings, 4A through to for F, and, and Sam, the leader's going to carry that. Can I move the motion to accept these minutes, please? And I second that, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Um, can we take that to the vote then, please? That motion is carried, thank you very much.
next item on the agenda is agenda item number five a council tax base for 2018-19 to consider the report of the chief executive and you'll find that on pages 29 to 32 and i understand councillor barry jr this is taking this one Hi, Mr. Mayor. Uh, council tax base for 2018-19 it's uh, an annual report a technical report that we receive uh, in association with the valuation office uh, the council has to set the council tax base each year in accordance with prescribed regulations those regulations are outlined at 3.1 uh, this is the first stage of setting of the council tax uh, calculation is made with reference to the number of banded properties within the local authority uh, you can see at 3.2 um, the latest valuation list uh, seen in the, the, the table there the declaration to be made refers to what is termed the band D equivalent of all properties it is estimated <laughs> that the collection rate 1819 will be 96 percent the financial implications the report sets the council tax base for 1890 from which the council tax will be derived if we go to the recommendations in 2.1 taking into account the number of properties in each valuation band discounts reductions for disabilities and future likely changes in the valuation list i would recommend the council passes the following resolution that pursuant to this report and in accordance with local authorities uh, and council tax uh, regulations 2004 the number calculated by the merthyr tydfil county borough council for 2018-19 shall be 18,098.08 and for the area covered by the bedlinog community council 1819 shall be 1148.02 removed mr mayor do we have a second up i second our motion thank you leader any questions no any comments no and we'll take that straight to the vote then please Thank you, that motion is carried. Next item on the agenda, uh, agenda item number six, uh, revised medium term financial plan 2018-19 to 2021-2022, update December 2017 to consider the report of the chief executive and you'll find that on pages 33 to 52 and I understand Councillor Barry Jr. is taking this forward again. Thank you Mr Mayor, the revised uh, medium term financial plan 2018-19 to 2021-22 updates at uh, December 2017. The provisional Welsh Local Government Settlement was announced on the 10th of October this year. The medium term financial plan 1718 to 2021 was approved at Council of 22nd of March 17 and indicated a projected budget deficit at that time of 6 million uh, 0 0.012 uh, for 1819. Projected budget deficit of 16,358,000 um, for the period to 2021. Um, the budget deficit now stands at following the, the announcement on the 10th of October, stands at 1.910 million for 1819 and 12.790 million uh, to the period up to 2021. Uh, the provisional service budget reduction proposals, uh, the budget deficit to 1819, stand at 509,000 pounds. In addition, the projected budget deficit for 1819 up to 2021 now stands at 11.126 million. Uh, revised budget projections are assumed uh, as council tax standing 
at 2.9%. Uh, we'll see in Appendix 1 uh, the summary of the Provisional uh, Revenue Settlement for 1819, uh, the medium term financial plan as approved by Council on March 22nd, uh, 17, is a Table 1, summarised at Table 1. The revised uh, medium term financial plan uh, is now seen. Uh, the projected budget deficit is seen at table two, uh, which includes the implications of the provi provisional settlement, the corporate additional demands, the corporate budget reductions, the budget reserve reprofile, and the indicative uh, additional demands. And there you see at the bottom of table two the 1.9 million and 12.79 up to 2021. The revised medium-term financial plan was presented to the Budget Board on the 18th of October. The implications of the provisional settlement um, can are outlined at Appendix 3 and summarised in Table 3. Uh, at Table 4, we can see the, the settlement as was, as we believed it to be, minus 4.5 up to 2021, and is now at minus 1 for 18.19, an indicative figure of two minus two uh, to 2021. The corporate additional demands uh, are outlined in table five. The corporate budget reductions uh, at seven um, are outlined and detailed in appendix five. Table six outlines the corporate budget reductions in more detail. Budget reserves are report profiled. You can see the detail of that. Table 7. Further budget considerations are at 9. Table 8. And Appendix 4 shows the service budget reduction proposals and proposed school savings. Council tax assumptions. The assumptions have been made at 2.9 for council tax with a collection rate of 96%. Uh, a 1% increase in council tax equates to 260,000 respectively. Uh, the indicative revised budget deficit of 509,000 for 1819 would require a council tax increase of 4.9% to cover that 509. The financial implications, uh, the revised medium term financial plan 1819 to 21 currently project a budget deficit of 509,000 and 11.126 million to 2021. Subject to the approval of all proposals in respect of service budget reductions and school savings. There are further pressures which aren't in this report, which have come to light since it, as the pay award notified on the 5th of December 2017 uh, that the National Employers for Local Government Services have made a final pay offer to the trade unions for period 1st of April 18 to the 31st of March 20 of 2% per annum, equating to circa 300,000, an additional demand for the council. We've had two uh, additional look after children for residential placements. The financial implications are still being worked on. The final settlement will be announced on the 20th of December, next Wednesday. Uh, final council tax base 1819, we've had the report on already. Uh, better indicative, uh, indicative settlement for 1920 with provisional 1.5 will follow the Chancellor's autumn budget. Additional monies to reflect the 2% national employers pay offer to trade unions and more detail of res in respect of specific grants. So if I take you to the recommendations for the medium term financial plan at 2, 2.1. Uh, the implications of the provisional local government settlement 1819 outlined in section 5 and appendices 1 to 3 be noted and accepted. 2.2, the cabinet recommended corporate uh, additional demands outlined in section 6, appendix 4 be approved. The cabinet recommended corporate budget reductions outlined in section 7 and appendix 5 would be approved. 2.4, the cabinet recommended budget reserve reprofile outlined in section eight, be approved. 2.5, the service budget reduction proposals indicate, indicated in section nine, be noted with further details provided to council 
protocol and completion of appropriate business cases where relevant. The Cabinet recommended schools budget reduction requirement identified in Section 9 be approved. 2.7, all recommendations are subject to employee, public and trade union engagement and in consultation where appropriate and any recommendations received from Joint Audit Scrutiny Committee. I move. Thanks, Mr. Hay. I second that motion. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Councillor Jones. Mr. Um, Mayor, can I take you to page 52? And it's the uh, service budget review. And there is our figures there for three years. 18, 19 financial year is a minus 484,000. But perhaps someone could explain to myself and other members when it refers to adjustments <coughs> to the medium term financial plan reflecting salary grades and points, membership of the pension fund business rate. And the last one, I think are a few throwaway words and general assumptions where applicable. Um, if I could have some clarity as to what that figure entails. If I could answer that one. And it's as it basically says, what we've done is to review the plan and we've reflected where there was no need for um, for just certain items which were added into the plan over the term and as it basically says we've reflected the the uh, just uh, adjustments to some of the salary grades and uh, <coughs> spinal points etc membership of the pension fund plus um, we've also looked at some of the assumptions as well within social care and some of those have been revised as well so there's a number of items in there which are just reflecting what what the actual need is for next year onwards and that is compared to what was uh, actually uh, reflected in the plan so i hope that answers your question Clive. i think so councillor lewis thank you mr mayor um the cabinet member mentioned additional pressures in respect of looked after children um, can you provide any further information on that, please, and um, perhaps indicate um, the cost implication? We've uh, received the two. They only came in last Friday, I think, Mr. Lewis. Uh, we're still looking at the cost implications. We're not sure at the moment. I don't know whether we've got any more information since I spoke uh, last to you. Have we got any more? It's, it's difficult for me to answer that. I mean, obviously, it's there's pressures on the budget. Historically, we've probably had about four children in residential. We've doubled that, that figure at the moment. Um, we're talking about individual cases, so I can't give you any detail. But obviously, the cost of placements for residential are very expensive. So if you want detail outside of council, I can give you that. Uh, Councillor Jones. Um, can I just have clarification? The cabinet member has just referred to the uh, pay I don't know whether it's a pay award or a pay offer. I don't know whether the um, National Joint Council have, uh, have agreed this. But the figure was given was 360,000 of a 2% award. Was that over the two years period? The 300, it was 300,000, Clive. Um, and it's per, per annum. Councillor Colburn. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in page 41, item 10, uh, council tax assumptions, we're assuming a collection rate of 96%. How much does that 4% equate to in monetary terms? How does that compare to other councils? And what are we doing about collecting this extra 4%? respect of what does the one percent equate to um if you just hang on for one second while i check my figures on that one
one second. Yes, if we could do the other bit first. Yeah, in, in relation to your other uh, close colleague question in relation to the collection rate being like 6%, uh, we towards the bottom end in terms of the collection rate compared to some authorities. Point of Gwenku is usually at, at the, the lowest, it's quite a substantially lower collection rate. And then basically there's a range of collection rates across different authorities in Wales. Um, generally, the authorities with the highest collection rates are those with the lowest collection uh, council tax bills. So, for example, the Valley authorities tend to have the highest, uh, the highest council tax bills compared to other parts of Wales, and that usually translates into lower uh, collection rates. But obviously, we, you know, we, we have increased collection rates over the last number of years incrementally by sort of point, point something percent every year. So it's at the highest rate that it's ever been. Um, and, it's, and it's also the council tax uh, reduction monies that are available for people who meet the criteria to support them if they uh, uh, unable to pay the, the council tax bill. But it is an ongoing uh, battle. Um, but we do persevere to collect any outstanding council tax over a period of years. Over a period of time, we, we make sure that everything that we are able to collect is, is collected. Right, okay, I've just managed to calculate the figure now. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if you basically looked at the 4%, that would be about £1.1 million. Pounds. So if you break that down, you're talking about £278,000 for every 1%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before you open it up for a debate, um, I'd just like to add a, a few uh, bits to the report and uh, basically what the Cabinet member said. Uh, I think clearly everyone in this room appreciates what difficult circumstances not only us as local government within Merthyr Didwell it stands, but other authorities surrounding us. Uh, we're all in a very difficult situation um, and clearly uh, you know, being one of the six authorities to receive the lowest council tax settlement, it makes it very difficult living in the area we do where there's a tremendous amount of deprivation, et cetera, et cetera, and it, people don't seem to take that into account. I think the report clearly that um, the, the, the cabinet members uh, brought to you, um, there are some very um, many issues in, within the report. The first one is the £930,000 uh, service savings. Uh, you've not looked at those yet. Uh, the cabinet's not looked at them and you as elected representatives, both at scrutiny or audit, have not looked at those savings yet. And as we would normally do uh, in, in a budget setting round, uh, we uh, as a management team will be presenting those to uh, cabinet shortly uh, in the new year, and then they will go to a, a joint audit and scrutiny committee for challenge, discussion, etc., etc. So that sets the scene in regards to 930,000. That's if you accept them all. On occasions, you don't accept them all. Uh, some are challenged, some are put back in, etc., etc. So immediately you see that those savings which are coming from the Chief Officer Management Team uh, can be challenged, and therefore the £509,000, which is the figure that's been set, uh, will increase. Okay? The second thing is on the £930,000, which will come before you. That's all to take effect from the 1st of April. Now, there will be a report which comes before you that says there is a, a consultation needed. Uh, that's consultation either uh, externally or internally uh, with the public and with the unions. If these savings cannot be uh, brought forward by the 1st of April and they drift, which they usually do, some of these, then that full year saving will not be found within that year. So therefore, the gap gets a little bit wider. They will be found, provided we deliver it in the following year, but in, the, in, in next year, uh, it will drift. And the reason it will drift is that you will have to set your budget. Uh, currently, we propose towards the end of February, uh, but if you don't set it towards the end of February and it goes into March, and we have to uh, to agree the budget by the uh, 10th of March, otherwise we'll be in breach of law, so, you know, it's crucial that we, we uh, identify that and move that, uh, that agenda forward. The fact has been raised that 509 is put in there. You can deal with the 930 in scrutiny and audit, and Cabinet will deal with that in, in regards to what they think they should, we should take forward as an authority. We've got a pay award of £300,000. So that puts it up to... Uh, £809,000, and we've got the additional um, need 
for additional monies for looked after children. And I think as Lisa has said, and again, we can clarify the figures, some of the placements are really, really expensive. You know, we've got children uh, in our authority, there are children in adjoining authorities, and many will know, which cost up to £150,000 a year because of their placement. Uh, and that's ever decreasing. And the previous administration know it as well because we've been in this position time and time again. We've got no control over it. We have to look after the welfare of these young people. We have to look after the needs of these young people and looking after needs has a cost. You are not setting council tax tonight, clearly, um, but there's an indicative uh, uh, um, figure within this of 4.9%. I know that's unpalatable to many, but you will know adjoining authorities, Caerphilly uh, have gone out to consultation on 4.52. Uh, Newport have gone out, if you don't know, on 5%. Uh, Pembrokeshire are going out at 12.5%. Uh, Bridgend are at 4.3%. You know, they're there or thereabouts. If you, set, if you set a council tax, which is either similar to what we currently got now at 2.9%, Welsh Government will look at us and say, well, actually, they'll need any extra money because you've set the council tax extremely low. We can't go back to Welsh Government and plead, uh, you know, that we need extra money. And I think, you know, and I apologise if this is a lecture, but I don't mean to do that. But this means there needs to be, uh, you know, pol politics in this chamber need to appreciate the position we're in. And if we set a low council tax this year, it's even worse for next year because we're on minus one at the moment. The average settlement for Wales this year was minus 0.5, and we're one of six at the lowest at minus one. The minister has given an indication for 19, uh, 1920 of minus 1.5. If, uh, if you do the, uh, the sums, the likelihood is on a minus 1.5, we'll come out at minus two. So all you do is build up a problem for the coming years. You, you see in this, someone tells me, as Chief Exec, as Ed Pay Service, are we going to find £7 million in 1920, given the cuts we've currently made? And they are cuts. They're not efficiency savings. The public will suffer out there. Okay? There are things we can do. There are things we can look at. There are things we can debate. But it's going to be very, very difficult. The pay award is 2%. That's what the employers have offered. We don't know whether they're going to accept it. That doesn't take into account either teacher's pay or any of that. So again, there's another burden on us. And we haven't balanced the books this year yet. Uh, and in month six, we were in deficit again. So we've got increasing demands in, look, uh, in the children's system. We've got increasing demands in education about special recruitment and what we do with those uh, young people. We need to put in uh, specialist uh, provision. And it just keeps increasing on us. So I just plead to you that when we look at this and we go through the budget setting and some of the proposals, as the previous administration will know, whether they were in opposition or whether they were in control, are very, very difficult and unpalatable. The only thing I would say is, if you take something out, something else has to go. Because the pot is what you know is the pot and we, we, we need to balance the books. What you don't want to be doing is storing up problems for 1920. So I think if you can just bear that in mind, as I've said, the reports will come to Cabinet. Cabinet will discuss it. They will decide, obviously, what they want to take forward and what they're not prepared to take forward. We will come up with some other options. You at scrutiny and audit then will deal with it. Uh, but we do need to be mindful that we do not want to be the first authority in Wales to fall over. We do not want to be the first. Someone will fall over. In the next 12 months, 24 months, an authority will fall over because they can't meet uh, the, uh, the requirements of service delivery. We don't want to be the first because we are the most compact, which means to be the smallest authority, and so what? What we need is one of the larger, smaller authorities to fall over first because that then may concentrate the mind. We don't want to be the first, and I don't want to be the chief executive of the first authority within this uh, within Wales to fall over. And I would hope that neither do you. Thank you for listening.
Uh, thank you for that insight, Gareth. Come say Roberts. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd just like to say it's nice to have Gareth back in the chamber with his wise words. Are there any last questions before we move on to comments? Councillor Amos. I just, it's just a question for Gareth, actually. It's, um, uh, you mentioned uh, council tax rates, Gareth. Um, do we have any indication yet of what our capital limit is uh, from the Welsh, the Welsh Government? You did mention one, uh, one authority of 12%. There is an informal limit at the moment imposed by Welsh... Well, it's not imposed. It's an informal limit of 5%. Uh, but Pembrokeshire, and they published it, it's been in the press recently, that they're looking at 12, I think it's 12.5% 12 uh, because they cannot balance the books. Now, whether they set a council tax at 12.5% is another thing to be seen, but that's what they're currently discussing to deliver the level of services they believe they need to deliver to the citizens of Pembrokeshire. Now, whether Welsh Government would, uh, you know, impose something, I don't know, Julian. But it's an, it's, it's an unwritten rule at the moment, Steve, isn't it? There's no legislation in, in, in place. Any further questions? Any comments? Councillor Jones? Yes. I've been in this chamber um, off and on since 1995. And there are occasions when officers have to say it as it is and I want to thank you Gareth saying it as it is because we are in extreme circumstances and we've we've got to make in my opinion very difficult decisions and who would have thought that one of the councils in Wales Pembroke who came out three weeks ago and said categorically they cannot, it's impossible, so you said in the press, to balance the books until and unless they have something in the region of a 10 to 12.5% increase in their council tax. And I just want to inform you that's an independent council. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Any other comments? Oh, Councillor Lewis. I think Gareth's words should uh, resonate with each and every member sitting in this chamber this evening. Um, if that's not a wake-up call, then quite frankly, I don't know what is. And to all the new councillors sitting in this chamber this evening, welcome to local government. Any further comments? Councillor O'Neill, please. Yeah, um, thank you for that uh, update, Gareth. We've had considerable conversations about that in the past. And if I may say this, I was awake eight months ago. Yeah, we've been working for eight months towards this. We've been going through it with considerable work. We're coming to the end of it now. And uh, I'm grateful for some of the conversations I've had recently with the leader of the Labour Party and uh, his insight. And I think together we'll have a chance to work this through. We've got to work it through. And I'm also convinced that the vast majority of the people in this chamber are you want to do that for the people. So um, we have been awake. And we have been working on it, but I'm much more confident that we can work together on it together now, and particularly after Gareth's, Gareth's well-put and concise uh, overview of where we actually stand. Thank you. Any further comments? No? Can we take out to the vote then, please? Thank you. That motion is carried. Next item on the agenda is agenda item number seven, trade union facilities consider to consider the report of the chief executive and you'll find those on pages 53 to 64. Um, I understand it's uh, junior again. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Mayor. Trade union facilities report, uh, it's come previously to us. Uh, we had to withdraw it because of lack of some of the information within there. We now have that attached to the appendices. Uh, the current facilities agreement commenced January 2016. Uh, trade union positions were offered to the two largest trade union organisations in Wales and the GMB. Uh, GMB rejected the offer, uh, resulting in one uh, trade union official, Marcus Williamson, um, 
with the implementation of the change programme that we're carrying on through, as outlined in the previous report and obviously with, with Gareth's input there. Um, it is critical that the uh, Council's business change programme can continue at a pace with continued involvement with trade union colleagues. Uh, Council has legal, legal obligation to consult with all, uh, all proposals uh, that affect employees. Uh, working collaboratively, collaboratively um, the Council has minimised the necessity for compulsory redundancies over the past 10 years of austerity. Um, it's really about introduction and background and reasons for the form of the review. Um, council arrangements are five. You'll see it uh, the table at 5.7. We've got GMB membership at 600. We've now had a revised figure of 960 for GMB. Uh, Unison yet to be confirmed, but we do believe that's still 860. Yeah. Um, financial implications. Uh, Two full-time trade union officials uh, will need to replace the two roles, the senior social worker role and the parks ground maintenance manager. That's on the belief that the the, that, uh, the individual holding that position actually gets this role because that's got to go to a ballot by, by GMB union. Um, the salary budget 2018 uh, for two full-time branch secretaries for both positions stands at 68,907. There is no identical budget to resource the two full-time representatives. The funding for the Unison post is currently being funded through an earmarked reserve until the 31st of March 2018. Additional funding would need to be made uh, to continue to support Unison uh, representative and GMB. Uh, I'll take the recommendations at 2.1. Uh, uh, facilities in terms of full-time representation be approved for the Council's largest two trade unions, Unison and G GMB, uh, with effect from the 1st of January 2018 uh, to, 2000 uh, to the 1st of January 2020 for an initial two-year period with a possible one-year extension subject to current approval from full Council, <laughs> that would be. 2.2 uh, two recommendations in the report regarding trade union meals bill be mooted. I move. I second that motion. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I've got at least two. Can I take you to the first part of the recommendations, which has just been referred to by the Cabinet Member, uh, where it says that um, this agreement is for an initial two-year period with a possible one-year extension. Uh, if you look at paragraph 6.5, on page 56, and it, I read it, the revised agreement also includes a requirement for the facilities agreement to be reviewed collectively every year during the term of the two-year period. Um, it doesn't seem to equate with the recommendations that we've agreed here for two years, <coughs> but then <coughs> it's going to be looked at every year. So has, has a discussion taken place and have the, are the trade unions involved accepted that that is to be looked at in the, in the two-year period every year? Thank you, Councillor. The, um, the, the paragraph refers to the facilities agreement, which is attached, which is just being agreed with all trade unions. Um, apologies if that's not totally clear within the report, but the facilities agreement itself, the attachments will be reviewed every year during the course of the two years. And if council agrees that that's wanted to go to the third year, it will also be reviewed in the third year as well. So you're, you're agreeing to the secondment, but the, the general facilities is something that will be looked at together with the unions. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, yes. Um, my other question is in relation to the second part of the recommendations, 2.2, um, which leaves me a little confused, uh, Mr Mayor. It says the recommendation of the report regarding the trading of wills bill to be noted. Well, if you look at page 55 and 4.4, uh, uh, it refers to the trading union wills bill will disapply three core sections of the UK government trading union act 2016 in relation to the devolved public sector. And then it refers to the three of them as three of those three dots should be under 4.4. 
and not 4.5. So, um, can I ask if this, um, the, the lead independent administration are accepting uh, the three core sections would this apply uh, in the assembly? And I mean, wh I can't understand why we would vote them, to be honest. Um, the, the three points were, were just to bring it to the attention of the full council that the, the, the bill was approved last year, so it's more than information I have as well. So is it being accepted that that part of the, the Tridium and Wales bill is being accepted? If we note it, it doesn't mean that's been... I think what's being said here, obviously uh, the trade union Act 2016 is 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 a is a statute on the statute books. Okay, the Trade Union Wales Bill is a bill, so it's not been formally gone through the process at the Welsh Assembly to to receive an enactment. So the issue is, it's still in draft form. Until it's enacted, it won't become law within Wales. So you need to note it because it's not law yet. So presumably. Uh, a report will come back. Jeremy will bring a report back in due course when the trade union, uh, tr the trade Wales bill becomes an act, and then he'll say all these provisions are now enforcing Wales. Because in reality, uh, and I don't know where it where it is in its process, it could change. So I think what Jeremy is saying is, look, you, you're some th uh, three issues which are being disapplied uh, in regards to Wales. Uh, and just note them for the time being, just to keep you up to speed. Uh, but when it becomes law, we'll come back and clearly we'll tell you. Well, I'm not a very good lawyer. Caris is the lawyer, not me. But, uh, but I thought there is a little bit of confusion, isn't there, there? And uh, I'm sure that's what Jeremy meant. Any other questions? Any comments? Chair, um, I'd like to make a comment because it's been mentioned by the cabinet member on page 56 um, under, under 57, <coughs> and that's the, the membership. Um, and it does say uh, somewhere else there, the membership, um, it's got the figures there, are clearly more than that because there are a few hundred members who pay by direct debit, so they wouldn't be listed in the checkoff system. Any other comments? Councillor Amos. Far, far be it for me to, to comment on legislation, but I was under the impression that the trade union uh, Wales was now an act, not not a bill, uh, and it was actually on the statute books. O obviously, Gareth uh, will be able to comment on that. And I thought it was an actual act. I'm not sure, Julian, because I don't know. I'm just picking up from what's within the report. That can be checked clearly if it, it if if it's been enacted then uh, Jeremy can come back and say when it's enacted and when, when those provisions come into force because, uh, again, as you know, they don't necessarily automatically come into force on the day of enactment. Sometimes it's three, six months. We'll, we'll just get that checked out for you, okay? Thank you. Any further comments? No. Take out to the vote then, please. Thank you. That motion is carried. Next item on the agenda, agenda item eight, workplace stress policy to con consider report of the chief executive. You'll find that on pages 65 to 104. Um, it's the junior show. So what is a stress policy next? <laughs> workplace stress policy. Uh, the issue of work-related stress and what the council can do uh, to manage the effects across the service areas. Uh, work-related stress will, uh, would put down the workloads, workload pressures, as you can imagine, uh, including tight deadlines, too much responsibility, lack of managerial support. Uh, stress survey was done in June 2017, where all staff had the opportunity to comment on the levels of stress at work. Um, the council uh, was recently recognised as having the lowest levels of sickness absence across all 22 Welsh authorities in order to reduce this further and to meet 
the Weaver's Weekly to reduce risk uh, to the lowest uh, level is reasonably practicable. A works, workplace stress policy has been prepared. Uh, there are no financial implications for this. A um, little bit of background there on the policy to defund youth embassies. Uh, council recommendations 2.1, uh, council approves the workplace stress policy. I second the motion. Thank you. Any questions? Senior. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, Mr Mayor, it's, it's gratifying to see in 1.6 report that the hard work that's gone on over the last five years has resulted in the, the sickness levels being the lowest in Wales. Uh, hard work has come to fruition there. But as we talk in particular about workplace stress, have we got any figures or, or comparisons showing how we're doing in, in relation to that uh, within Wales? Uh, any, any figures on how we're performing? Uh, current figures for the council is 15%, and that compares to 40%, so that's less. Uh, that relates to the stress generally, uh, both outside of work and work-related stress, and we're working on the system to get more meaningful information, particularly in relation to workplace stress. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Jones. Well, yeah, Sean, the, the follow on from uh, Councillor Barry, uh, in the report, um, the summary of the report and the 1.4, it refers to the stress survey was carried out in June this year, but having read it, um, I can't uh, see where the number of the number of staff will reply to that survey uh, and um, the total number were, were asked, one, but how many replied uh, to it? to it because um, they could well be people in this organization who are suffering stress um, some of them clearly don't know it and um, answer decide not not to answer the survey thank you councillor the uh, survey was issued to all staff uh, back in june the response rate to the survey was 40 percent <laughs> Um, in addition to the findings, we're, we're, we want to undertake a number of focus groups with staff as well to share with them the findings and to work together on some solutions moving forward. But in particular, we're keen to know as well why the 60% felt um, that they couldn't complete the survey at that time and whether we're doing the survey on an annual basis. All I ask, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that when we put the sample, particularly in something like this, we need to see the numbers so that we can identify if there's a real problem. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, and it's in relation to the policy, um, and to welcome the stress policy, but if you look at page 73 and the 6-1, six, six it intimates there that councillors have roles and responsibilities. Um, and just a quote, uh, the first one there is to maintain an ongoing commitment to reducing the risk associated with work-related stress by ensuring that council complies with the policy. Um, what I would like to know from that uh, and the other two points under B and C um, is how are we going to monitor that? Is, it, is that going to be the subject of reports coming to cabinet and or council? So if we've got a role, we should, you know, know all the facts and figures. Maybe this is also going to scrutiny as well, I don't know. I'm happy to provide information on an ongoing basis in, in relation to uh, statistics and actions that, that will be taken moving forward. Uh, we do plan to uh, bring a report to call council as well regarding the findings of the survey and the actions that will be taken moving forward. Any other questions? Any comments? No? Can we take that to the vote then, please? Thank you, everyone. That, that vote is carried. Next item on the agenda is agenda item number nine. Trago Mills Megastore, creation of a tourist information centre to consider the report of the Chief Officer Community Regeneration. And you'll find that on pages 105 through to 110. And I understand Councillor Geraint Thomas has taken this one. Yes. 
Maybe do me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, right, it's the Trigo Mills Mega Store creation of a tourist information center. The summary report is set out between 1 and um, 1 1.5. Uh, the purpose of the report is to inform members regarding an opportunity that has been presented to the council in the form of the use of a unit at the Trago Mill site in Murphy Tidville, which has the potential to be used as a dedicated tourist information center, a TIT. The report outlines the scale of the proposed Trago Mill site, which is set to be the first megastore outside the, to the southwest of England, costing a staggering 40 million pounds. The 200,000 square foot facility anticipates an annual footfall <coughs> of approximately 2.5 million to 3 million visitors, each of which have to walk past the proposed tourist inf information center. In terms of the actual 22, 22 square meter unit itself, the Community Regeneration Department will undertake a period of research to scope out the best fit and aesthetic feel and look to implement new technologies which will complement the traditional meet and greet information service. With anticipated visitors figures possibly reaching 3 million people, the TIT is the perfect mechanism to showcase what Murphy Tidville has to offer <coughs> with regards to its tour tourism infrastructure while showcasing key sites of interest from in and around the county borough. The report also outlines the next steps the Community Regeneration Department <coughs> will take in order to fully develop the facility and subsequently house three staff members in the TIC by the beginning of April 2018. In the recommendations 2.1 to 2.4, um, we're asking the councillors to approve an allocation of 95,000 as a growth item of the next two financial years instruct the Estates Department to discuss and secure heads of terms with Trago Mills, approve the recruitment of TIC officers that will be operational based on site at the Trago TIC, approve the submission of a Visit Wales Tour Investment Support Scheme application to fund the TIC out at the TIC. I so move. I second that motion, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I welcome uh, this report. Uh, you can't uh, avoid, I wouldn't have thought, a, a tourist information centre where there's two and a half to three million visitors going to walk past it. Um, but in the report under the financial implication that has been touched on by the Cabinet member under 7.2, it says that uh, income generation schemes will be introduced which will hopefully enable tourist information centre to become self-sustaining thereafter. I wonder if uh, any officer here can give me an example or two of what we would be looking at uh, to generate um, more income to cover that 95,000. Yeah, I'll, uh, I can answer that, Ms Jones. There are, there, are, there are several opportunities that are currently being explored. Um, Obviously, there's the link up with um, both local and regional tourist attractions on a booking basis. There's the potential of a booking service for local and regional accommodation providers. Um, there's also the purchase of bespoke trips. And we're also currently looking at what complementary quality provision of small item sales can generate quite an income. Councillor Barry, junior, senior. <coughs> Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, we've asked to approve the recru uh, recruitment of officers. Um, I don't know when that will take place, but can we have assurance that at that time, if we've got any at-risk staff within the organisation, they get an opportunity to apply that before it goes out for advert? Yeah, that would be implemented as a part of our existing policy. Um, the store is due to open uh, no date confirmed, but roughly around the Easter holiday period in uh, in April this year. So we'll be starting to look at not the recruitment process yet, but the pre-recruitment process. Any other questions? Any comments? And can we take that to the vote then, please? Thank you, everyone. That vote is carried. Next item on the agenda, agenda item number 10 is redistribution of Fossil Frank grant funds.
to consider the report of the Chief Officer Community Regeneration. And you'll find that on pages 111 through to 114. And I understand Councillor Karen Thomas taking this one forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the re redistribution of Fossil Fran grant funds, the summary of the report is set out between 1.1 and 1.2. There is currently a provision in place to move any underspend from the Fossil <coughs> Fran small and intermediate funds into the large fund. Due to the popularity of the most recent Fossil Fran intermediate panel in September 2017, which saw 18 organisations request a total of £71,524.79. The Community region, Regeneration Department would like to request that funds can be moved from the Force of Fran Large Fund into the Force of Fran Intermediate Fund. The recommendations in 2.1 um, requests up to 30,000 to be moved annually into the Force of Fran Intermediate Fund if there is demand for this level of funding. I so move. I second the motion. Thank you. Do we have any, que do we have any questions? No? Any comments? No? Can we take that to the vote then, please? Thank you. That vote is carried. Next item on the agenda, agenda item number 11, is the cold weather plan to consider the report of the Chief Officer Community Regeneration. You'll find those on pages 115 through to 128. I understand Councillor Garen Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, very apt that we should be bringing this report to Council um, this week after the severe weather we've had over the weekend. Um, the cold weather plan, um, the summary report is set out in 1.1. To consider the attached cold weather plan, also referred to as a severe weather emergency protocol SWEP, which outlines the Council's proposed response towards rough sleepers in times of severe weather conditions, particularly cold weather. <coughs> the, pro the proposed plan is attached, which you've already read and seen. Um, in the re recommendations um, in 2.1, 2.2, um, consider the implications of rough sleeping on the role of the council, particularly during periods of severe weather, um, to recommend to council that the proposed cold weather plan is adopted with immediate effect. I second that motion. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Councillor Jones. It, it, there's only one chair on page 116, and um, I, I accept that the cabinet member said that this is, um, you know, the report has been dealt with tonight. But under 3.6, it says the, the trigger for enacting the plan is a Met Office forecast of zero degrees or below for a period of three consecutive nights. Uh, I understand that uh, part there on the north degrees or below is buried in 300 pages of guidance from the, uh, from the Welsh Government. Uh, with the severe weather we've had in the last few days, and obviously uh, temperatures dropped down, and I understand the DWP also use something similar for certain of their benefits if it drops below. Um, were we able to do anything in the last few days for some poor people who were um, you know, sleeping out? If I respond to that, Councillor Jones. Um, yes, we have. Um, on Monday, um, it was predicted to be minus nine degrees in, in, in the evening, so we, we uh, placed two uh, people in, in danger on Monday, even though the policy uh, wasn't in place uh, at that time. Um, the guidance itself, yeah, it is 300 pages long, but there's only one line in there around the uh, cold weather plan, so there's no detail of what it should contain. Um, so the, the trigger, which you mentioned, um, has been taken from um, a document called um, SWEP and Extended Winter Provision Engaging with Rough Sleepers in, in Winter, and it was devised by a homeless, homelessness organisation. Um, but the, the, the guidance itself, the, there isn't anything in there that assists us in, in developing a, a, a cold weather plan. Comes to Skinner. Given that the three consecutive nights is a guideline only, and according to item 5.1, the winter night three nights, because somebody could die. It only takes one night of minus 10 for somebody to die. Why do we wait three? 
It's we've just made reference to that particular document, uh, and and it's been you know it's been general practice. So um, the, the ba it's the balance between that and and the cost of the local authority. Um, if you want to reduce it, then um, obviously we can consider that, but it would mean that there would be additional potentially additional costs. And it is it is a document that was produced by homeless. It's only reference really that we've got for for dealing with this sort of thing. There's reference on 5.1 now that the, if I could just read it out, um, the total cost per annum cannot be estimated with any accuracy. Um, the, hang on a second. The winter night shelter secured by the council but run and managed by volunteers does not cost the council a fee per night per person. So that's, if it doesn't cost this, is, is, there, is there scope for for that to be looked at, I suppose. We've, we've operated a, a night shelter over a, over a number of years. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's a 12 week provision uh, that we've, we've operated for the last three to four years. That's slightly different to the, the cold weather plan because obviously the weather is what the weather is and it could kick in when we haven't got a, a night shelter operating within the, within the authority. So you know the, the the plan could be triggered outside of the provision for for the night shelter. So as, as it has done this week. Can I can I just add? Uh, I, I think yeah. Whilst Councillor Skin obviously raises issue about guidance, guidance is persuasory within the law. So uh, you know obviously if we're going to go against that guidance, we need reasons to do so, and it's within your power as a council to do so. I think uh, given the, um, uh, needs to be reasonable, balanced and proportionate what we do in regards to this, this matter and it's very emotive again. I think the issue you're going to have is if this council decides, if it decided to say it would be one night and then we'll open up and uh, provide, we may then become the floodgate capital and homeless capital of the valleys because people will know, the message will get out in Merthyr Tidville you know, it's only one night if you're homeless, they'll put you into accommodation. I know that's very difficult to say, but that can happen. And I think if the adjoining authorities are all three nights, then clearly we've all got a duty to do it. And that's what the government is recommending. You know, I would have thought the government's taken into consideration one night. I should imagine they've had that discussion because there will be uh, documents backing up the guidance. So, you know, it's, it's a matter for this council ultimately. Uh, the money may well be for small, 50 pound a night or whatever. But when you add that up, if, if this m winter gets really cold, which it's currently going to do, you know, it was minus four, it was minus nine, uh, you know, I think the uh, predictions tonight is it's going to go to freezing again because we've had a, a cold weather warning again tonight, is that, you know, we will be filling that gap with providing homeless people with accommodation, uh, if that's, uh, you know, a social duty you wish to do. But ultimately, uh, we have to find the funds somewhere else then to backfill that that uh, that gap, so you know it's robbing. I don't mean robbing Peter to pay Paul, but if you want to do it, we can. But we will have to find the, the funding to do that, and then when something else comes along, we'll have to find funding to do that. And you you know you can understand fully the position we're in in regards to uh, you know finances within this authority. I can see. I take your point but 50 pounds a night and, I'm, and we're talking really small amounts of people and I, I get the fact that it might increase and I, but we could, we could cross that bridge when we come to it if that was the case. I just think if we were talking thousands of homeless people in Merthyr, I could understand, but we're talking small amounts of people and you know, minus 10, it just that could be mean the difference. That one, even if we were to reduce it by one night, I'd, I'd be happier, I'd feel more reassured Councillor Thomas. Um, I was out with the outreach last night in town and there was um, 10 uh, rough sleepers that, that came for a hot drink and some hot food. <coughs> they are some of the most vulnerable in society, but some of them are challenging as well. Um, until the night shelter is open, the only place we can house these people is in a bed and breakfast. And we've got to hope that there's a free bed there as well. If there's not a free bed, there's nowhere for them to go. So that's, that's one problem we've got. And the other one is on the risk assessment, um, with some of them being you know, dangerous, um, drug addicts, a bed and breakfast won't take that. And there's a massive issue there as well. 
Thank you for answering that question. Yeah, just uh, two things, really. Um, just to add with, uh, to what Mr. Thomas said, obviously when we're considering about placing anything, we have to consider safeguarding. So it's not just the vulnerability of the individual, but the vulnerability of people that we know are also placed in, uh, I in that similar B&B accommodation. Um, the ideal scenario, which lots of authorities are looking at, not just Merthyr, uh, the ideal scenario we've, we've discussed for uh, for several months in terminal is the provision of what's known as a housing first model, which really turns around the whole concept of housing uh, homeless and vulnerable people in starting with a house uh, and a tenancy and wrapping support around those individuals rather than starting with the capability of keeping a tenancy, which is currently what is uh, what is used as a route to get people into accommodation. You mentioned about the risk assessment, um, Councillor Thomas, I get that, but I d how does that impact on, the th the surely that doesn't make any difference from, that's not why they kept waiting for three nights out in the cold, is it? Because of the risk assessment or lack of B&B &B accommodation, is it? Is it no, it, it, it will be, you know, um, by some of them you can't house. You, you can't house them in, in the current format where you are. They, you know, you can have a situation that was in Blackwood in Argoid, where a chap kills somebody in a bed and breakfast. You know, some of them are very challenging. And you know, I in a perfect world, it'd be great if you could put them in somewhere every night of the week. You know, I have advised them to come to the housing manager to get risk assessed early. So once we know we got the as soon as the cold weather plan comes in, we've got a telephone number, phone them, say, hey, there's a bed available for you, get in there now. But it is difficult. But it's challenging. Three, three Can I just suggest, I know Councillor Davis wants to come in. If Councillor Skinner, obviously very passionate about this, and I don't, you know, um, if she wishes to move an amendment from three days to one, then Councillor Skinner should do that. Obviously, if it's seconded, <coughs> then it'll have to go to the vote. If that's, if that's an issue this authority wishes to consider, because it's a matter for the authority to make a decision. So if Councillor Skinner obviously wishes to put to the motion to this authority, that we should reduce it from three to one, then obviously that's open to you. So I just make that as a suggestion. Come to Davis. Mr. May, I think um, you know, a good way to perhaps deal with this is the advice provided by the Chief Executive in that you know we take each case um, on its merits and that we build into this policy that we delegate to the Chief Officer for Community Regeneration or the Head of Public Protection and Housing to consider a case um, on its merits, and I think that covers everything. Then, you know, I think Councillor Skinner is right that you know we wouldn't want a death on our doorstep here in Murphy Tidville as a result of a decision around policy. But I, I, I work in you know uh, social services where we you know use bed and breakfast accommodation, and there's quite a very tight and strict risk assessment uh, whereby you have to consider the risks posed by the public and to the public by uh, by individuals who do. Um, display challenging behaviour, and we don't want you know any issues around that where an innocent person, like in Argoid, um, you know, was sadly murdered by by somebody who'd been released from a hospital setting. So maybe that's a caveat that covers everything. That you know, a uh, point is agreed by council put into the policy that, on its merits, case by case basis, be delegated to the either the chief officer or the head of housing and public protection if that's satisfied, then they can be considered as and when they come forward. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Well, I've listened very uh, closely to the two of the debates so far, and I think there are two issues, really, separate issues between uh, somebody who is challenging and where you actually draw the line uh, as to when you actually house them. If someone is challenging, uh, they will always be challenging. So really, the three-day uh, thing doesn't kick in. I can understand the three th three day uh, cut off for housing someone uh, or putting them into accommodation, settled accommodation or whatever, uh, because of a weather forecast. But I, I don't understand it for as for someone with challenging behaviour. The other point I'd like to make, and I'd echo Councillor Skinner's point, is that you really can't put a price on life or death, because even one day someone could die on those streets. It's all right for us because we've all got a warm home to go to. These people are sleeping rough in car parks, 
uh, under under arches and to me three days it's, it increases the prospect of someone dying and this authority this town has got a reputation and a history uh, as, a, as a caring socialist uh, town uh, who cares for the weakest in society and to me you just cannot put a cost on this and uh, if Councillor Skinner is prepared to move an amendment uh, to make this one, I, I would certainly second it. Councillor Mitten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that, you know, whilst I take on board everybody's points, and uh, uh, Councillor Amos's, Councillor Skinner's, and, and especially Councillor Davis's very valid points about, um, you know, that delegated authority going to those chief officers, I think it's just to reiterate that we are a very caring council. We're a very caring um, local authority, uh, county borough as well. Um, but I think we're not missing the point here because it is a very emotive um, subject. What we're saying is within this policy is we're looking at guidance which suggests three days, which goes across other local authorities as well in their guidance. Now, um, what I've done is, you know, I have volunteered in um, homelessness shelters. I have worked with people who volunteer day in, day out. And I think that what we need to remember is during these vulnerable times, i.e. these winter months, we do have that 12-week night shelter provision as well, which is a voluntary service. So we have that availability for our, our homeless people. And then for those who really are vulnerable and need it, whilst perhaps that provision isn't available, then we have the ability to house them in the bed and breakfast that we have. So it's just balancing the needs of that individual and also that the service that's available at the time. So whilst I understand that do we go from three days to one days, I think if we go from one day, then we are leaving the gates wide open and we really are. And whilst I understand it's emotive, whilst they're the most vulnerable and I've seen it for myself and I've been down to the night shelter, etc., we will be leaving those floodgates open because we are we were looking at a permanent solution for our homelessness okay but as we've said people have very different needs and i think that needs to be taken into consideration because then as the chief executive referred to we could then be opening the gates where we could be seen as you know the place to come to the borough to go to and i think that we just need to balance that and this policy balances that quite clearly Councillor skinner are we saying that this plan is never going to be subject to be reviewed or altered again ever in the future? No, I was just going to make that point, actually. Sorry. Yeah, I was... Sorry. Yeah. Just to say that if, if, if sh that should happen, worst case scenario happens, surely then we review the plan. The plan's are subject to review. Can't we give it a try? It's not a huge financial... Impl it's not if it's not a huge financial implication here, I, you know, so it's not we're talking millions or thousands of pounds. I just, I would like to table the amendment. So, Councillor Skinner, can you be clear what the amendment is that you're putting? To go to one day. So. Councillor Barry. Mr. Mayor, I just wanted clarity. I, I thought you meant to be put it hasn't, but uh, just thinking out loud now that if it's to give delegated powers to the head of service plus the port roller member, we'd go for it. Right, thank you. What's been moved is that the process will kick in after one day rather than three days, as I understand it. Um, and if that's what you're being asked to vote on, um, can I ask whether there's a seconder for that amendment, please? Yeah, could I, uh, could I, could I just add something? Um, it's very difficult from an operational perspective to see how the the plan could kick in after a day because you could have one day and then it's it's not freezing temperatures anymore. Um, I totally accept that we'd be more than happy to review uh, what's in this plan 
uh, as we stated earlier, that the three days comes about as the uh, as the guidance from the Welsh government. Um, we'd be happy if the plan was approved as it was to review that immediately. It's it's a, an amendment that's been moved and seconded in any event, so we are going to have to vote on the amendment that's been put, which is that it's reduced so that it kicks in um, at one day. Uh, obviously, p members have now heard what um, what the officer has told us with regard to the issues that may be raised by that. But in any event, we need to take a vote with regard to the amendment, unless there are any further questions about the amendment. No, it's uh, just a case of process, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, if this amendment falls and another amendment is put up, that goes after the vote. Okay, can we take that to the vote for the amendment of reducing it from... Just check everyone's Thank you, Gareth. I was just getting to that. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> so... This vote is for the amendment to reduce the number of days from three down to one. That's what we're voting on. You can go ahead and vote now, Mr. Chair. That's the voting complete then. And there are three people in support, so one abstention, and there are 26 people against, so therefore the amendment falls. And we now will go to the debate on the substantive matter. Mr Mayor, can I propose an amendment? Councillor Barry first, please. Yeah, Mr Mayor, can I ask the legal to consider a further recommendation which states that uh, delegated authority is given to the head of service plus the relevant portfolio member to reduce the number of days in an emergency situation. Do you have a second for that? I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, but if we ask for an additional recommendation, can I ask that that's considered as well, please? And I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Well, I was just going to suggest what you had said in the beginning, what I spoke to in my comment, that we delegate um, to the corporate chief officer and the head of service that cases are uh, taken on a case-by-case -case basis, which is, which is, is, is formal work. Different to what Chris is saying, because Chris is saying asking for a reduction in the number of nights. I'm. That's what you. Sorry, sorry Mr. Mayor, I'm asking for delegated powers for the head of service plus of the cabinet member to make whatever decisions necessary in an emergency. Any final comments? Just to say that I would support that. So, Mr. Mayor, you've got three recommendations. <laughs> you've got those two which are contained within the report. Um, and there's sorry, the sorry, which is the delegated power uh, to the uh, chief officer and the head of service, oh, the, the cabinet member with the head of service in an emergency to, to look at the, which really gives, you know, if we go in down to minus 10 or something and then have another night at minus 10, then they may wish to implement that policy. Is that okay? Does that clarify it? Good. Is, it, is everybody clear? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. So, sorry, Mr. Mayor. So this is an additional recommendation 2.3, is it? Yeah. So we're voting, we're voting on, no, it's a recommendation. So it's now, we know there's now three recommendations yeah. on this. Can we take that one to the vote, please? <laughs> Thank you.
marvelous. And give you patience there, everybody. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is agenda item number 12, post 16, home to school transport, to consider the report of the Chief Officer for Learning and Chief Officer for Community Regeneration. And they can be found on pages 129 through to 164. Uh, Councillor Thomas, take this one forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's the Barrier Thomas show tonight, I think, was it correct? Um, right, post 16, home to school transport. The summary of the report is set out in numbers 1.1 to number 1.4. Um, the, the report proposes changes to the current post 16 home to school transport service. The service is discretionary and making changes will allow savings to be made. The report seeks approval to consult on options to change the service. A business case, Appendix 1, has been developed that appraises five options. Option 1, the service remains as is. Option 2, provide free post-16 transport only to the College Merthyr Tidville or to the schools that are near a suitable that will provide the post-16 education. Option 3, provide free post-16 transport only to College Merthyr, Merthyr Tidville, Welsh School and Faith School. Option four, provide post-16 transport at a cost that makes it cost recovering. And option five, remove the service. The consultation process will ensure that the community has access to the information about all the possible options before any decision is made. It will also give the community the opportunity to suggest alternatives if they have any. There are no financial implications within this report. Um, the recommendations that, in 2.1, in noting and debating the content of this report, Council approved the start of a public consultation exercise regarding options for the provision of post-16 home-to-school transport. I so move. I second that motion. Do we have any questions? No. Any comments? No. Um, can we take that to the vote then, please? Thank you, that vote is carried. Next item on the agenda is an exempt item. So in order that the following can be considered in private, it is suggested that the public be excluded from the meeting on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraphs 14, 15, under part 4 of the Schedule 12A of Section 100 of the Local Government Act 1972. Can I ask somebody to move the Section 100, please? I'll move to Section 100, but then I'll go straight to the Chief Executive. I will do. I just thought we may have been pulling that item, Chief, so we still need to move it. Okay, so I'll move to Section 100. I second it. And can we have put that to the vote, please? Thank you. That vote is carried. Okay, so we're back in the reopen session. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is to deal with it. Any other urgent business? Mr. Mayor, Thomas please. Mr. Mayor, can I just uh, reassure Councillor Amos and thank him for his contribution in regards to the uh, the Trade Union Wales Act, which was. Uh, given royal assent on the 7th of September, and it came into force on the 13th of September. So, uh, you know, thank you, Councillor Amos, for your support. The power of Google, Chief Exec, yeah? <laughs> Probably ably assisted by one of your officers, I'm sure. <laughs> oh! <laughs> So, okay. Mi Mr. Mayor, 30 no, 30 witnesses and this is recorded, so... <laughs> Mr. Mayor, does that mean that... Sorry. I didn't have it on. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, does that mean that the report said no to it, that that's... Or does that, that's it? Yeah, I, I think, uh, ch clearly, j uh, Jeremy can look at it now and bring a, a short report back before you and uh, just update you as to what actually has been enacted. I had a quick look at it, and the base, sorry, Mr. Mayor, the basis is there's a set of statutory um, instruments that also need to be put in place as well. So whilst we've got the 7th of September, 13th of September, uh, one of the provisions said that uh, it needs to, uh, and because the print is so small, uh, you know, uh, we
we just need to get that back to you. Thank you. And if we can move on to agenda item number 14 to deal with any other urgent business or correspondence. I understand the leader has something to say. Yeah, just to end on a cordial note and uh, the new era of cordiality. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm not going to spoil it, don't worry. I'm not going to spoil it. Just um, as leader, I'd just like to say a couple of things. First of all, how impressed I've been by all the councillors' involvement, engagement with the homeless, with those vulnerable. They've been out on the streets in this, in this, in this terrible weather, but also with the, the snow and the clearing of the roads and the grits. They've all got involved across the piece, whatever party, whatever area. And also, finally, out of the highways department, who uh, overall generally do a sterling job in very, very difficult circumstances. And finally, uh, to wish everybody a happy Christmas. <laughs> Thank you. And the last item on the agenda is to receive communications for His Worship the Mayor. I do have something I would like to read out that came to me from Councillor Goldsworthy. Mr Mayor, it is my proud duty to inform you that on Sunday the 10th of December, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize at a ceremony in Oslo. ICANN is a coalition of 468 organizations from 101 countries of which the Nuclear Free Local Authorities is a member. As Merthyr Tydfil is a member of the Nuclear Free Local Authorities, we can be proud of our involvement and the part we have played in winning this award. The NFLA Secretary, Sean Morris, who is a local government officer based in Manchester, was invited to take part in the ceremony in Oslo. Sean's work in this field is a major contribution towards achieving this award. We in Merthyr Tydfil can be proud of the part we have played in ICANN achieving the Nobel Peace Prize. Ernie Goldsworthy, Chair, UK and Ireland, Nuclear Free Local Authorities and Merthyr Tydfil NFLA representative. Thank you, Councillor Goldsworthy. And it just leaves me to say, Hofu now dimino Nadole Clawen, a bloy then knew it the e he e geed. Happy uh, <laughs> Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs>